Hello everyone and welcome. This is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society and tonight we are going to be doing a live session of stargazing and so when you go out tonight and you go outside you'll be able to look up and really understand what you're looking at. So we have a really great presentation for you um, for tonight. So go ahead and set your volume levels and let me know in the comment box how our audio and how our video is looking. We're going to just do a little bit more on the technical side here and then we're going to start right at the top of the hour. So if you haven't done so let me know um, where you're calling from or connecting <laughs> where you're connecting from and um, also where in the world that you're connecting from so astronomically speaking we can also include some information from your part of the hemisphere so i'm really excited to be joining with you tonight i'm also going to be joined by astronomer kent wallace from the astronomy club and you'll be able to interact with him and ask him questions and we're going to have a really great time we'll be together for an hour probably a little bit more and we'll be answering questions at the very end so if everything sounds good and looks good let us know in the comment box also please introduce yourself let us know if you have a telescope where you are in the country what your love of astronomy is what you're really looking forward to hearing about tonight so we can do that as well and i will be back in just a few minutes
this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm so excited for tonight's stargazing session. If you have been in the San Luis area, you know that we have not had great observing lately because of all the smoke from the fires and so forth. Um, however, I do want to just kind of put this out there that if it wasn't for that, we would be having amazing star stargazing right now. So hopefully that's gonna clear and just go poof and we are gonna see some amazing some skies and stars. But it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to go outside, look up, and really understand what you're looking at at the end of tonight's presentation. So tonight is actually a free class. It's provided by the Central Coast Astronomical Society. I'm the current president of that astronomy club. And if this is your first time with us, I wanna extend a special welcome to you. Let me show you where you can find out more information about us. So you are, um, you can simply go to our website, which is right here, centralcoastastronomy.org. So centralcoastastronomy.org and find out more information about us and including uh, what where our club is about as well as view different, um, different images and astrophotography from different members and kind of see different things that we're up to. So you're welcome to be a part of that. You can um, join in our mailing address or put your email address in here to join our mailing list. And also, I would recommend um, liking our videos and subscribing to our YouTube channel so you get reminders when we do these periodically. So I'm really excited to have you here with me tonight. There are a few ways that you can interact with us tonight. Um, a number of you are watching us on YouTube. That's fantastic. You can type a question at any time into the comment box and both myself as well as Brian, I'll bring him on in just a minute. You'll be able to say hi to him as well. Um, we'll be answering those questions. And then we're gonna take some of the questions and actually ask our astronomer Kent to answer those for us tonight. So um, we're gonna go ahead and let me show, so there are three ways to connect. You can do it, just, just type your questions in at any time, any time at all during tonight's presentation. Um, the second way is that you can simply use the information at the bottom of the screen. Do you see it there? It says um, you can email or you can text us. So the email is questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. So grab a pencil and just write this down, questions at centralcoastastronomy.org or you can text a phone number. Don't call it, there's nobody there, but we have set it up for folks that aren't able to use the comment or don't have email. You can quickly text us this, and I will read this phone number twice, just in case you can't see it. It's 805-242-6415. I'll do it one more time. Okay, got a pencil? Okay, 805-242-6415. Four one five. If someone wants to type that in the, into the comment box, just so it's kind of near the top, that would really be helpful too. Uh, we're actually going to take that off, that information off, once we get started. Um, a couple other things: if you've downloaded the handout for tonight, go ahead and get that out with a pencil. As we go through it, you can make your notes in there, circle things. Um, if you have a highlight, you can highlight things that are really of interest to you. I've left some white space in here as well, so you can write your own notes in there as we go along through tonight's presentation. And the very last page includes answers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is not a test. You will not be turning it in. Um, it includes our telescope and binocular recommendations. So if you've been thinking about, oh, maybe I should get some type of, you know, binoculars or something, you could spend $35 and get the ones on here and they work really well for other from Celestron as well as um, telescope recommendations as well. So if you have specific questions, uh, please look at this information first before you ask those because we've answered a lot of those. We've taken the questions from previous classes classes and put the answers to those on the back page. So hopefully that will be helpful to you as well. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that we also gave you a link for a star chart for the month of August. And so what you want to do is when you print this out, one of the questions is, well, how do I use it? I mean, there's a lot of information on here. Did you notice? Okay, so how this works just real quick is once you, once you print it out, you'll see it says north, south, east, west. So the idea is this thing goes over your head and this is what you will see 
in the night sky. So each one of the little dark dots is actually a star. And so you're going to line up the south with the southern horizon, the north with the northern horizon, and everything else should be pretty much lined up. And you'll be able to see, oh, you know what? If I look over here, that's Pegasus. Oh, but over here is Cassiopeia. So it kind of gives you a general rough outline. So I can look to the south and so forth and see Sagittarius and that sort of thing. So that's how these things are meant to be used. Um, I personally like using those along with an app on my phone that will help me find things. So if you're new to stargazing, there's like a million apps out there. Um, my personal favorites, um, there's uh, Sky Safari is one of them. There's four or five of them that I like to use in conjunction with the map to kind of orient myself and figure out where I am looking in the sky. Tonight's presentation will take a lot of that guesswork out. We're going to actually show you how to find these things just with your naked eye. And most of the objects we're going to focus on tonight are binocular objects or naked eye objects. You're not going to need a telescope. Okay, so let me, let me see here. So I think we've covered most of it. If you've just joined us, hi, my name's Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. Tonight we're going to be doing stargazing. And if you're really serious about doing this stargazing thing on a regular basis, please subscribe to our channel so you get these, um, these uh, session reminders every time they come out, which is about once a month. So, all right, Brian, uh, let's have you um, say hello to everyone. Let's see if I can find you. Give me a second. Wait, don't say anything because they were not going to hear you. Hang on. <laughs> okay, they should be able to hear you now. Brian, hi. All right, hello, Aurora. Hi. And hello, everyone who's joining online. I'm glad you could join us tonight. I'll be moderating the chat, so let us know those questions over the chat or text or email, and then we'll uh, address as many of them as we can. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. If you guys are ready, just go ahead and give me a woohoo. Let's get, let's get this party, star party going. Let's get the star party started. Kent, are you there? Uh-oh. <laughs> I think we lost our astronomer in a black hole. Hey, Kent, 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 are you there? Brian, do you hear him? No, I do Hello? not hear him. Hi, Kim. Can you hear me? It's Aurora. Okay, astronomer, There's I can't nothing over the you. phone. Hi, Kent. I'll have to. Uh, you know, I can't hear anything over the phone. You can't hear anything over I'll have to redial. Okay. Sure. Why don't you go ahead and redial and come back in? So, Not a problem. Kent, oh, uh, Kent, are you able to hear oh. me? I can't hear anything over the phone. Okay. So we are going to give Kent just a minute to get back on. Oh. Brian, do you want to help him out with that? Answer a few questions that are coming. Yeah, well, I'll I'm try to. Redial. So, Kent, can you hear me right now? Okay. All right, so while they're working on that, not a problem. Technology is, is amazing these days, isn't it? Okay, so I'm gonna answer a couple of questions that have been coming in. One of them is, do you have to be a member of the Astronomy Club to watch this? No, this is totally free and it's open to all ages. So it doesn't matter if you're six, doesn't matter if you're 96, you are welcome to join us tonight. The second thing, what if I don't have a handout? Not a problem. You just sit back, enjoy the show. This is for you. Um, I put this handout together so you could make notes as you go along. It's not required. This is just going to be something that we're doing just for you. What do I do if I am in the Southern Hemisphere? Okay, so we're going to be covering the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere. Mostly it's going to be in the Northern, but Kent is um, one of the really cool things about him is he's actually done a lot of observing in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So he'll be able to uh, field these questions for you as well. Now, something that's really unique about Kent, he's been stargazing for a long time. And what a lot of people don't realize is he's not looking at star charts. When he's gonna be taking us on this tour, um, he is actually doing it all from memory. And what's really cool is people use Kent as a way to correct their computer programs. <laughs> so he will be able to look at something and say, no, that's not right. Your numbers aren't quite right. That star really isn't there. And so he has this amazing ability just from raw hours of, at the IPs just observing. So we're really lucky to have him for, um, for our <laughs> tour guide tonight. Um, Brian, you're still working on your connection with Kent. 
Okay, so he's dialing back in. Okay, so we're just gonna give him a minute. Let me go ahead and answer a couple of more questions. Uh, what software will I be using tonight? Okay, so I'm gonna be, have you ever been to like a planetarium star show? That's what tonight's gonna be like because it's really hard for me to go outside with you and point around. You won't be able to see what I'm pointing at. So instead, I have a planetarium software set up on my computer and I'm gonna share that screen with you. If you would like this same program, then you wanna go to Stellarium S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. If one of the audience wants to type that in for me tonight, that would be great. Stellarium. Hi, Kent. Hi, welcome. Stellarium is stellarium.org. S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. Stellarium.org. And you'll be able to see the same things and do, do the same things that we will be showing you tonight. And so we're going to get started. It sounds like Kent is back on. Brian is helping him right now. Okay. All right. And so, yep, it looks like he is just about all set. So thank you everyone for being so patient. We are going to get ready to go here. Brian, are we all set? All right. Let's go ahead and bring Kent on. Let's see. Hang on just a second. All right. Kent, are you there? Yeah. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes. Hello. <laughs> thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for your persistence and calling in a couple of times. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> So, Kent, before we get started, um, I actually um, I have a question for you. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to share with folks maybe who have never met you before, um, just real quick, just like like maybe one minute, two tops, um, just kind of your background, like what where did you first get interested in astronomy? What were you, what's your favorite telescope, that kind of thing? And I, I'm going to show them a picture of you doing um, uh, with your orange Celestron. Oh, okay. Um, actually, originally, I got a book called The Stars by H.A. Ray. Uh, it was to learn the constellations. I wanted to learn more about the sky. Uh, once I got a bit better at it, I was using an old pair of binoculars that were my grandfather's, some 7X50 uh, naval binoculars. And, uh, you know, basically in about three months taught myself uh, the constellations I could see from Visalia, California. And uh, then later on got a little uh, J.C. Penney's 60-millimeter uh, refractor. Uh, it was good for looking at double stars and planets for the most part. And uh, basically I stuck with that until I started working at Diablo and had the money to buy that big orange thing. And that opened up a whole brand new world for me. Awesome, awesome. And so, um, what do you? What's your favorite telescope to observe if you were going to go out tonight? Uh, right now, it'd be Venus and not Venus, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, just because they're such awesome planets and they're so close to each other. So those would be two I'd go after. Um, I'd probably go after some of the uh, stuff in the in the hook of. Uh, Aquila the eagle uh, in the fish hook at the bottom, like M11, uh, those sorts of things. There's a bunch of planetary nebula in uh, the eagle there, so I'd probably be working my way through some of those. Okay, great. So basically what we're going to be telling people tonight. Pardon? Uh, so basically the things we're going to be showing people tonight, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's basically uh, it's up high, it's overhead, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the stuff to go for. If you, if you stay out later and later, other stuff will come up. Mm -hmm. But we're hitting the stuff that will be up once it gets dark right now. I'm pretty much overhead. Okay, great. Okay, are you ready to go, Kent? Yeah, let's go. All right, let's do it. Okay, so um, for those of you that have just jumped on, this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. I'm on with Brian as well as Kent. Kent is going to be our astronomer taking us on a tour of the night sky tonight. If you have specific questions that you would like to ask, you can do it in the comment box. Brian will be answering those during the, uh, while Kent is talking. And you can also, I'm going to make this go away, so please write this down if you need to. You can also put them through an email um, uh, to questions at centralcoastastronomy.org.org, or you can text it to the number that you see there on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to take that off in about 10 seconds, and then we are going to get going. You ready? Okay, Kent, what is the first thing you would look at tonight? 
Uh, Jupiter. Tell us about Jupiter. Jupiter would be the first one to look at tonight. And uh, then slide over to Saturn. That would be the second one. They're both uh, in the south. They're both uh, very bright now. So those are the two big ones for planets. Awesome. Okay, hang on just a second, Kent. Let me see um, if I can show people where this is. So if you look on, um, we're looking at Stellarium right now. This is what it would approximately look like if you were to go outside tonight. And do you see I've got these red marks here? If you can't read it, this one in the middle is south. And the one over here on the right is southwest. And then we have southeast. And so basically tonight, if you go and look south you'll, and look straight up, you will actually t see two really bright stars. One is Jupiter and one is Saturn. And you'll be able to look at these with binoculars. And Kent, what are they going to see if they look at Jupiter through binoculars? If they've got good eyesight, they should be able to see a couple of the moons. The moons are all in a straight line. And so there might be two on one side and two on the other, or it might be one on each side. It all depends on how good your eyesight is and yes. how good the binoculars are. Yes, exactly. And I actually have a picture of that in your handout here that came through tonight. Okay, great, great. Um, and so um, Kent is going to be talking through this, and then periodically I'm going to interrupt him and show him where, to, where you can find these things. So right now we're just looking due south. Okay, so we're looking at Jupiter, and um, are Jupiter and Saturn going to be in the same place all year long, or are they moving? Uh, Jupiter is, you know, it's at uh, five astronomical units versus Saturn's roughly 10. So Jupiter's moving faster to the east than Saturn. So next year, Jupiter will be either catching up with Saturn or slightly past. I don't know for sure, but they might even be closer next year. Uh, I just don't know. There's like a, what is it? There's kind of a wiggle that occurs also. Uh, makes like a little loop sometimes with some of the outer planets. And uh, so they might get closer together, but Jupiter will probably be on the other side of Saturn next summer. Wow. Awesome. Okay, great. And so it, I'd be interested knowing if they're going to, you know, next summer, how close they're going to be. Because mm -hmm. it's unusual for them to get that close. Awesome. Okay, great. And um, is there any other planets you would look at? Well, if you wake up early in the morning, Venus is up nice and high and very bright. Um, about a week back or so, I had to get up early, and uh, it was way up there. I think it's, you know, like a high point almost, and you can't miss it. It's really, really bright. Mm -hmm. So... If you're up in the morning, you're looking eastward, you see a really bright star, that's going to be Venus. Nice. Okay, great. All righty. Do you want to mention the meteor shower that just passed, just briefly? Yeah, we can, we can mention that. Okay. Uh, that's the Perseids. It, it's the best on the night of the uh, 12th, mm -hmm. but it's spread out on both sides. Uh, you know, I'd say maybe... Uh, a week or so on either side. Um, you know, twelfth night of the 12th is the best. You know, this was a good year because we didn't have a big fat moon sitting up there. So that makes a difference seeing the fainter, uh, you know, uh, meteorites mm -hmm. or meteors. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately now it's the 22nd, so we're 10 days past so, you know, but next year it will happen. It's, it's regular each year. So that's a real nice thing about it. Awesome. So I was wondering, what's an asterism? An asterism is a grouping of stars. It's not a constellation. It's just uh, a grouping of stars that people put a name to. Um, the Big Dipper is an asterism. You know, it's not Ursa Major or the Big Bear. It's the Big Dipper, but it's just a grouping. It's not a um, a constellation. And asterisms can be little small parts of constellations, or they can include multiple constellations. They're just a pattern that people recognize uh, in the sky. Nice. 
Okay, great. So what kind of asterism would you recommend people look at tonight? Tonight, we actually, there's several. Uh, I think there's about four of them. But the big one is what they call the Summer Triangle. And it's made of uh, Vega, Altair, and Deneb. Those are all first magnitude stars. Awesome. And so it's going to be a neck breaker, right? It's directly overhead. Yeah. You know, the younger people usually are a lot more flexible than the, you know, the old <laughs> geezers like myself. I've noticed as I've gotten older, it's harder to get at those high angles. <laughs> but, you know, for young people that are flexible, you know, or if, you, if you're patient, everything moves to the west. So if you want to stay up late, it'll get to a better uh, height above the ground. And uh, so, yeah, those, uh, those are almost overhead right now. Uh, Altair is a bit easier because it's in the south. And uh, so that one, you won't be as high an angle. But Vega and Deneb, they're way up there. Yeah. They are. They are. But, you know, that's the good one to start with uh, for tonight. Uh, oh, I guess I should I mention the legend behind those three stars? Yes, please do while I figure out how yeah. to get rid of my red box here. Hang on. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, there's a legend tied in with the three stars involving Hercules. Mm -hmm. And uh, there must have been some different constellations at one time tied in with Vega uh, Deneb and Altair, uh, those three represent these monstrous uh, killer birds. Uh, they had iron wings, iron beaks, and iron talons, and they would eat people. And so Hercules' uh, sixth uh, labor out of the 12 was to go and, you know, kill these birds that are eating people. And so it ties in with Hercules also. But that's, you know, an old... Uh, uh, legend. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about some newer legends that's tied in with uh, uh, Deneb is tied in with uh, 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 what is it? Cygnus the Swan uh, uh, and Altair's tied in with Aquila the Eagle and Vega's tied in with a musical instrument the Lyra or Lyre so those are how it ties in Awesome. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, give me just a second here, Kent. I've got a problem with my pointer here. Um, tell me about, you were going to tell us about the um, uh, Lyra. Do you want to start with that constellation? Yeah, that's pretty much how the handout's roughly tied up like that. And Lyra would be a good one to start with. And okay. there's the uh, mythology behind uh, Lyra as a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me tell you that. Yes, please do. And folks know that I'm um, trying to get my pointer working again for you. <laughs> so go ahead, Kent. Yeah, there's, there was this uh, musician, uh, Ophius, who was the best in the world. He would charm animals. He would charm rocks, trees, humans, and gods. He was really good at it. And everyone loved to hear him play. And, uh, his wife got bit by a snake and died. So he played for um, Pluto and his wife, which are, you know, he's a lord of the underworld, mm -hmm. to bring back his wife. His wife was called Eurydice or something like that. Mm -hmm. Hard to pronounce. Yes. But he was trying to bring back his wife. So he has to go to Hades and get her. But there's one condition. And that is when he's leaving Hades, he's not to look back. She's following behind him. And, uh, you know, once he leaves the underworld, then he can look back. Well, she was so quiet as he was leading her out, he didn't think she was there. So almost at the end, he turned and looked, and she was there. So he was doomed at that point. Aww. His wife went back to the underworld. He was despondent. Uh, he always played sad melodies, and uh, even after he died, his, his lyre kept producing music. And so I guess to quiet the lyra, <laughs> lyre, uh, 
uh, Zeus sent it up into the sky, mm-hmm. which we you know know as uh, the constellation of Lyra today. So that's uh, I thought that there's a bunch of different legends, but I thought that was a cool one because I kind of remember it as a kid. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, that is a cool one. And so that's the mythology behind Lyra. Perfect. Um, I guess we should talk about the star, the bright star in there, which is Vega. Yes. Which is a, it's about 25 light years away. It's uh, about one and a half solar masses. Uh, It's what they call an A-class star. It's a white star. And it's only 385 million years old. So it's a fairly young star. It's also the fifth brightest star in the sky. And, you know, our solar system is roughly four and a half billion years old. So this is really a, a young solar system. They've actually seen a disk of, uh, of dust around Vega. So Vega's kind of interesting that way. Plus, it's nice and bright. It is. It's very bright. Um, do you want to talk about the double-double and a few things in um, yeah, this sure. constellation? And then I'll back out and show people where to find it tonight. Yeah, the double-double is uh, neat. Uh, it's two binary pairs of stars that are separated. I've got, let's see, about roughly 200 uh, arc seconds. So that's what, about uh, three and a half minutes, roughly, somewhere in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember I had a 90 millimeter refractor, just all lenses, and I modified it to get a seven millimeter Nagler into it and i could get both of the pairs what they call the double double uh i could see the separation between each of the stars uh in it so that was really cool with a 90 millimeter uh uh, objective lens and uh, they're arranged they're they're actually epsilon one and epsilon two epsilon one is the northern one and epsilon two is the southern pair uh epsilon one is roughly a magnitude 5 and a magnitude 6 star with a separation at 2.8 arc seconds. So fairly close. Mm -hmm. And then the southern pair, Epsilon 2, is roughly a magnitude 5.1 and 5.4 with a separation at 2.6 arc seconds. So they've got roughly about the same uh, separation. That's amazing. So what looks like to your naked eye, just to kind of recap what Kent was saying, in this little teeny tiny constellation here, here I'll connect the dots for you. So if we're looking here, so this is the bright star Vega, and I'll show you where to find that in just a second. And then if you kind of look just right next to it, there's two stars that you'll see don't look quite like a pinpoint it'll look more like an oval with binoculars and if you put a telescope on it each of those two will resolve into two yeah that's the cool thing yes that's why they call it the double double Uh uh-huh awesome um okay do you want to talk about uh delta two okay delta two lyra um it's a it's a good binocular one i think you know and if you got good eyesight probably better eyesight than I got, (laughs) you can at least see the separation. Uh, It's it's easy to see in binoculars, but uh, if you've got really good eyes, uh, you might be able to see it. Because I think about the limit for super good eyesight is about 60 seconds of arc. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's just kind of a good practice type uh, star. Yes. And when you look at it tonight, it'll kind of look like this. (laughs) So how do we find this? You know, you don't have all these little sticks connecting all these dots, right? So how do we find this? Okay, so Kent, let me interrupt you for a second here. Um, So if we are looking, it's pretty much overhead. So I can go north and look up, or I can swing this around. Sorry, I don't mean to make you sick. And I can go south and look up, and I'm going to see the three really bright stars here. Let me turn off the little dots. Okay, so I'm going to be looking for three really bright stars. And so Deneb, Vega, and Altair, we're actually going to hit all three tonight. They're each part, as Kent mentioned, 
part of a different constellation. You see there's an eagle here, this is the harp, and this is a swan. So these bright stars are in different constellations, but they're an asterism because they, we think of them together. So in Vega, so you're just gonna go out tonight and look up and you'll see two stars that are gonna be closer together and then Altair is gonna be the one over here by itself. And Vega, this is the one we're looking at. And if you see Vega and you drop down to inside the triangle, you're gonna see a parallelogram of stars. Do you see that right there? That parallelogram right there? Here, I'll connect the dots so you can see it better. Do you see that parallelogram? That's what we're looking for. And this is the little naked eye one he was just talking about, and the double-double is right here. So just by knowing where Vega is, you can kind of zoom around with your binoculars and kind of look around and see if you can find things. All right, Kent, what else do you want to tell us about Lyra? You know, it's it's really useful if you have like that, the stars by H.A. Ray, because mm -hmm. it shows Vega, it shows the pattern that you're looking for. So. I actually had an old flashlight I put my mom's nail polish on to make it a red light. <laughs> put it on really thick, and uh, that's the way I could recognize the pattern with the binoculars. Mm. And so that's, you know, a, uh, a good way of, uh, of getting it, or, or the chart that you give out. You know, as long right. as you, you've got that, you can work out the pattern with your binoculars. And uh, let's see, the next thing to talk about is beta actually i'd like to talk about beta lyra okay and also gamma lyra okay but beta is the weird one beta's yes. got two massive stars right next to each other and um, as one evolves into a giant it drops mass onto the other one they're actually distorting each other they're so close in and uh, they're really massive so they're actually changing their evolution by swapping mass around. And when one becomes a giant, then it spills out mass into the other one. Since the other one's getting more mass, it'll probably become a giant. <laughs> and uh, so Beta Lyra is kind of an interesting uh, uh, binary system. You can't see any of that other than just realizing that star has neat properties. Mm-hmm. And then gamma, the reason I, I brought up gamma is it's the other bright one. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be uh, to the, the left and down a little bit. And uh, the two make it real easy to find the ring nebula. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I wanted to bring up gamma and beta is you can actually see gamma and beta naked eye. And if you put your telescope right between them and wiggle it around a little bit, you'll see a little donut uh, hanging in the sky there. And, uh, and I've seen it really nice and clear in my 8-inch, but even my finder scope, my 8x50 finder scope, if I use an O3 filter through that, I can actually make it pop in. It only looks like a star. You actually have to have you know, a telescope to get it large enough so you can see a diameter. But, uh, yeah, the uh, M57 is like the archetype planetary nebula. It's known as the Ring Nebula. I think maybe John Herschel may have given it that name way, way back in the 1800s. But uh, it's a real interesting planetary nebula. Uh, when I show it to people, I call it Homer's Donut. <laughs> because it really does look like a donut through the 20 inch. It totally does. It totally looks like a donut. Did you want to um did you want to tell people about eclipsing binaries like for 30 seconds? Oh, that's right. That is like eclipsing when they're between our line of sight. They're lined up perfectly. One will move in front of the other and if it's dimmer, it actually blocks the light from the brighter component and the brightness drops. Then when it swings out, you've got the combined two of them together, and then one slides behind the other one, and it causes another drop in the brightness. So that's, yeah, I forgot to mention that. It's an eclipsing binary system. It just happens to be lined up mm -hmm. so, you know, we can actually see the variability, I believe, mm -hmm. with Beta Lyra. It actually gets dimmer and brighter over time. It since does. these guys are swapping around there. Oh, yes. Yeah. The image I showed is not the one we're talking about. That was Venus transiting the sun. 
Um, and that was real data, not just something that was not an animation, that was real. So when Venus crosses the path of the sun, the sun dims just a teeny little bit. And you can see that in the little light curve wiggle that I showed you. Okay, great. Oh, um, got some more information on the M57 or the Ring Nebula. Oh, yeah, 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 so go ahead. It's one of the Messier objects. It's also roughly about 2,300 light years away. Uh, don't hold me to that because planetary nebula are really, really bad for distances in the professional journal. They're scattered around, but it's out there a ways. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, visual magnitude is about 8.8, .8, so it's not you know it's actually fairly bright for a planetary nebula. It is. But uh, I've noticed in my eight inch. When you look at it under good conditions, you don't have to be real high power, just enough so you can see the ring pretty nice. There's actually like a, a faint haze or like a gauze across the inside of the ring. And you can see that in like an 8-inch. It isn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's something that um, I don't think I've ever seen that in other planetaries like that. And so it's, it's kind of a neat aspect of... Uh, of the ring nebula. Now, planetary nebula, there's no planets involved. Do you want to just touch on that real quick before we move to Cygnus? Right. It turns out that the, the reason William Herschel called them planetary nebula is the geometry. They look like a disk, and planets look like a disk. And so that's why William Herschel called it a planetary nebula. He really didn't know what they were. Uh, later on, he he suspected that it was made out of like a gas or a fluid, but that was later on in life. Uh, but they have nothing to do with planets. They're just, uh, you know, stars that have essentially burned up all the hydrogen in the core, and they reach the point where they're making a white dwarf in the center, and there's no more energy. They essentially blow off outer layers and that white dwarf in the center, well, the pre-white dwarf, gets extremely hot, gives off hard ultraviolet, and causes the outer layers that have been thrown off to glow. So you get all sorts of geometries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it may be due to hot Jupiter. It might be due to another, you know, like a binary star system. They still don't know uh, why the shapes are the way that they are. You'd expect that a spherical star would generate a nice sphere, uh, but it always doesn't work that way. The ring's pretty good. At least it made a ring. Yes. But there's so many weird-shaped planetary nebula. It is. This one's like looking down a toilet paper tube. It's like a barrel that's expanding. That's one of the models. Uh, it actually kind of tapers down, and then also it spreads out as you get away from it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Long-term exposures actually show a fainter envelope around the ring nebula that you you got to do photography. You can't see it naked eye, mm -hmm. but there's it's been shedding material for a long time yeah. to uh, get in that state. All right, you ready to go uh, go say hi to Cygnus now? Oh, pardon? Should we go off to Cygnus, the Swan? Yeah, Cygnus. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Got Cygnus here. Okay. Um, so how do we find Cygnus? Let me show people where to find it. Let me turn off all these little fancy labels. I wish these labels were out there at night, don't you? <laughs> when we go out there, but they're not. So Cygnus let me even... <laughs> is, you know, Cygnus is pretty easy to find naked eye just because of the asterism that's inside of Cygnus, which is what we call the Northern Cross. Mm -hmm. And you've got Deneb which is actually the tail of the swan. Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, gamma, which is the center of the swan or the center of the cross. And it's got this long neck that goes to a really neat double star called Alberio. There we go. And Alberio is his head. Yeah, it's the head of the swan. And in fact, the wings extend out a little extra on each side from the actual cross figure. The, uh, the cross is interesting because the northern cross figure is, uh, you know, you can actually see it there. So you've got the cross arms and the upright. 
uh, where Deneb's at the head of the upright. But on December 25th, it stands around 9 o'clock on the western horizon. So the, uh, you know, the cross there is kind of an interesting uh, asterism or northern cross Mm -hmm. is an asterism because they've also got the southern cross down in Australia. Yes. And so, uh, you know, that's really neat. Yeah. Well, should we talk about Deneb because it's kind of a neat star? Yes. Tell us all about Deneb. What's so cool about this star? Yeah, Deneb is an awesome star. It's a long, long ways away. I think, uh, what did they say for distance? If I remember right, it was, what, about 6,000 light years, something it's okay. way out there, um, and uh, the interesting thing about it is that it's a supergiant. It's a white supergiant. It's uh, oh, here I got I've, I found the figures. I can never keep figures in my. It's twenty six hundred light years away. They figure the latest figures. Awesome. But it's it's a massively large white supergiant. It may be the brightest one. For a a uh, a class A uh, supergiant, it's about the size of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, so that's about 200 times the diameter of our Sun. Wow! And you know, so it's really big. It's also brightness-wise, it's about 10,000 times brighter than our Sun. If you could move it in as close as Vega it would be as bright as a big crescent moon. Whoa. So if Deneb and, was where Vega is, it would be huge. Yeah, it would be it would be a monstrously bright star. You know, it's it but instead it's so far away. I mean it's it's roughly a hundred times further away than Vega. And so you know that's a long ways out there because the inverse square law for light. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's really a, a unusually bright supergiant. And the thing is, you really don't see it by looking at it. It's actually visually it's dimmer than Vega or Altair. Got it. But then it's a long, long ways away. <laughs> it is. So what is the thing that everybody looks at when they go to Cygnus? Uh, actually... You know, they look at the Northern Cross, but the the real crowd pleaser, you know, once you get looking at specifics, would be Alberio. It's like the, you know, one of the prettiest double stars in terms of color. Uh, you've got icy yellow and blue. And if you use low power, wide field eyepiece, you'll see the color really nicely. You don't want to go high power. Just have a nice wide field. They're separated by, what, about 35 arc seconds. So they've got a good separation. And uh, they look really pretty. I mean, it's one of the most, you know, it's it's called like the, you know, the prettiest colorful double in the sky is Alberio. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay, so let's practice, everyone, before we move on to our next constellation here. Let's practice finding it. Okay, you ready? I'm going to make all the star names. Actually, my star names are locked. I have not been able to get rid of them, so we'll just leave them there. But let's see if you can actually find them. Okay, we're walking outside. You and me, we're walking outside. All right, we're looking north. Okay, so where are we going to find the... Here, I'll mess up the sky. Wee! Okay, so (laughs) we're we're going to go north. And then we're just going to look straight overhead... And, boy, it really helps when the star names are still there, huh? I've been trying to get them unlocked, and my keyboard is stuck, I think. Um, And so you'll see these three stars that are going to form a triangle. Now, where is Lyra? Do you remember? Okay, so you go just inside. You go to the big – so Altair is going to be over here. We haven't talked about him yet. He's associated with the eagle. So Deneb is going to be the – Deneb is actually Latin for duck butt. So this is the butt star of Cygnus, this one. Yeah, it's the tail (laughs) tail of the swan. Yep, it sure is. And then here are the wings. You see that? And then if we go here, here's the head. It's pretty much in the middle of that triangle. And that's Alberio with the two different color stars. And, And, you know, to tell you how – 
Yeah, to go tell ahead. you how important our burial is, tell us. they gave it the beta. You've got alpha for the nab. It's really not beta in brightness. There's, you know, gamma is brighter than beta. But because it's such an important, colorful double star, they gave it beta, which is kind of interesting. That's awesome. And Lyra, did you find it? Did you find the parallelogram? Yep, you just it's really close to Vega. It's right here. And where's the double double? Can you see it? So here's the parallelogram. The ring nebula is right in here. And here's your double double. See, look at all these things you know where they are now. And the double double is just um, it's similar to the one uh, Alcor and Mizar in the um, Big Dipper where if you zoom in on it with binoculars and telescopes, you'll split it into more and more stars, even though they all combine into look like one to your naked eye. Okay, Kent, what should we talk about now? Oh, one other thing about a burial yeah. is they're uncertain whether it's a binary or a, um, you know, just a line of sight double. The, the separation is so large, they might as well not be a binary because... They're saying it takes way beyond 10,000 years if they are a true binary. We don't know. There's, you know, questions on both sides. Oh, you just, I see a beautiful picture of Alperio. <laughs> yes, that was actually one. I don't actually have the astrophotographer name. Usually I do. Um, okay, great. So tell me about what else is in Cygnus that we'd want to look at, like a nebula or something? Yeah, there's a supernova remnant, which is called the Veil Nebula. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the pictures of it are pretty awesome. It's quite large. I think it's roughly about uh, six, six full moons uh, across from one side to the other. There's an eastern side and a western side. The western side they call the filamentary nebula, mm -hmm. and it goes right by a naked eye star called Cygnus 52. And, you know, it's, it's really nice to have a, a bright star next to the deep sky object that you're looking for. Yes. And in my, in my eight inch without filters, I can see the wisp going right by uh, Cygnus 52. And it's also given an NGC number, what was it, uh, 69... Uh, oh, I actually wrote that or... down. Wait, let me grab my other slide. You beat me to it. Uh, 6960, that is what you told me. Right, the, the filamentary side of it. Um, oh, oh, were you, think, a... you thinking the other side? Oh, were you thinking the other side? The other side is the eastern side of it mm -hmm. is called the Network Nebula. And that truly looks awesome in my 20-inch when you put like a 2-inch O3 filter mm -hmm. in my big eyepiece. You get filaments going everywhere. I, I, <laughs> basically, I have people grab the scope and move it to follow the detail. I mean, there's, you know, it looks like an egg crate pattern to me. There's so much detail mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the network nebula part. Also, if you have dark skies and good eyes... You can actually see the network nebula in a pair of binoculars since it's all by itself out there kind of hanging in the darkness. Wow. Uh, my eyes aren't that good, but uh, uh, there are people that have seen it with a pair of like 750 binoculars. Yeah, nice. But it's, it, it looks totally awesome. Uh, you can see by the pictures there's a lot more stuff in there. There's kind of like a, a wedge-shaped object kind of in the middle that extends downward. I think that's called Pickering's Wedge. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff there. And I've had kind of fun with my 20-inch to try and follow the different pieces of it because it's really a big object. And supernova remnants are relatively rare. And so, you know, there's like one in the Messier listing, which is M1 or the Crab Nebula. Yeah. That's awesome. So where do we find this thing? It's actually, if you know how to find 52 Cygnus, that's the easiest way. Okay. It's off one of the, uh, the uh, you know, wings, the first part of the wing of uh, Cygnus there. And so I see your, the graphics will kind of show you where to look. It'd be on the, uh, the eastern side of the, uh, mm -hmm. 
of the Northern Cross or Cygnus there, about the middle of the wing, and then 52 Cygnus is just over from that. So the easiest thing is to find 52 and start there because it's a good indicator. And then if you want to, you can just cruise on out into the into the darkness mm -hmm. looking for the network nebula. If you go at the right angle and far enough, you'll stumble across it. Awesome. So here it is with all the things taken off again. Here's our summer triangle that's straight overhead. So this is great if you put down a sleeping bag and then you have your binoculars and you're like laying on pillows and cushions and sleeping and soft stuff, right? Because you can look straight overhead and not like kink your neck. So you're looking straight overhead. You're going to see this right here. You're going to see the, the three stars. And so again, there's Lyra with Vega. So Deneb, you're going to find him. Do you see that? Now, where are the wings? Do you see the wings? There they are. Great. Now, where would we start to look? If we suddenly forgot, we know it's this wing. So I would start looking at some bright stars around here and see if I can maybe pick out the right one. And look at that. You will find it. Now, here's a picture taken uh, last week by an astronomer from our club of this exact thing that I'm showing you here. So here, he actually took a picture of this from his um, little observatory he has set up. And I'm trying to find it. Where is it? It is, it is, it is right here. Um, here it is. Okay. So this is a picture that he took from, I think it's Los Osos or it could be Morro Bay. I don't remember. Um, so this was an image taken by Peter. And so this is the one that was taken from really dark skies. And this is from our own little central coast area. Isn't that cool? And that's right. going right by uh, 52 Cygnus there. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many filaments there are in that nebula. Tell us more. What else should we be looking at? Uh, there's actually a little cluster of stars that kind of is, are like the Pleiades. Uh, you know, it looks like a little dipper, but it's kind of short on stars. Mm -hmm. And it's called Messier 29. It's kind of towards the central body or or over from Gamma, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's just a, a little open cluster that, you know, if you look at it closely enough, you'll see this kind of truncated Pleiades or truncated little dipper type figure in it. Nice. There you go. Okay, now to find that would be, there's Deneb, there's our little duck butt, and there is the body of the swan and the wings of the swan and so you're really close to that intersection there if i turn on the lights maybe that'll be the lines would probably be a little easier and you can find it right there yeah it's not far from the center star there which you know i call gamma it's what mm -hmm. Seder or something like that yeah you know there's actually a lot of uh telescopically interesting objects around that area you know, it's loaded with, uh, it's right, you know, along the center line of the Milky Way. So it's loaded with dark nebulas. And there's actually a wolf rayet star that makes a big crescent, mm -hmm. which we haven't even discussed. <laughs> or, you know, but it's, it's an interesting uh, object near that gamma star there. Nice. Uh, right in the center of the Northern Cross. Perfect. Now, was there... Um... I think we've covered most of Cygnus that we wanted to cover. Somebody had asked about the black hole, and yes, the first black hole that was ever discovered back in the 70s was from Cygnus. Oh, I know something about that. If, oh, tell if, us. You know, I think it was called Cygnus X1. Yes. And there was a famous uh, astrophotographer by the name of David Malin in, down in Australia, and... What he did, he took a bunch of photos around the, you know, they had rough coordinates because it's really hard to, uh, you know, bring in something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for, it's actually in a binary system. You've got the black hole and then you've got the star in orbit around the black hole. And when the star whips around the black holes coming towards you, the light is blue shifted. Mm -hmm. When it goes in front of the black hole and leaves, it's red shifted. So he took a bunch of photos looking for 
a star that changed color. You know, as it's shifting around, it would be red one time and blue the other. And I didn't know this until a few years ago, the story behind this. Mm -hmm. But that's how they found you can't see the black hole, but you could see its effect on its companion there, you know, looking red and then looking blue. And he was really famous for doing uh, uh, color astrophotography with big monster telescopes. There it is. I just found him as you were talking. Here we go. Yes, and that's so exactly that's, what he that's did. That's a story I remember. <laughs> and that's him. I thought you can it was actually... fascinating that he just, just looked for a star changing color. Mm -hmm. So you can and read so more about, the... about him as well. Professor Paul Merton. Oh, no, it wasn't Paul Merton. It, it was wasn't? actually... Uh, um, His name is here. Oh, with it. David okay. Mayer. David Malin might have been working under him. You know how the, oh, the yes, graduate student is listed as et al. Uh -huh. in, the, in the paper. <laughs> so yes. David Malin might have ended up as an et al. in the, uh, oh, in the no. graduate paper <laughs> about Cygnus X1. But he's done well by, by uh, the work that he's done <laughs> over the years. Oh, we all know about that. Okay, so working for other people, not quite getting your name on the first as first listed. <laughs> okay, great. Um, all right, let's see. The question, um, let's save some of those questions that we've got for more of the end. I don't see anything about Cygnus specifically. Um, okay, great. Do you want to go on to the little fox? Yeah, let's go to Velpecula since it's kind of shoved up against uh, Cygnus there. Okay. And it's got a couple interesting things to cover that are binocular objects. Okay. So we're talking about and this one here. So you remember how to find Cygnus. Oh, wait, let me turn off the things. So we're looking at Cygnus, the swan here. And here's Alberio. And the one we're going to talk about now, Volpecula, the little fox, is right off of Alberio. Okay, go ahead, Kent. Yeah, it's more of a modern constellation. But the, the cool thing is it's got Messier 27, which is the... Dumbbell Nebula. Mm -hmm. It's one of the four Messier uh, planetary nebula, and it's very visible in binoculars. Mm -hmm. Looks like a little cloud. In my 20 inch, you can actually see the dumbbell shape, and you have blowouts on the uh, on the uh, other sides or the darker sides. You can actually see faint blowouts. So, the dumbbells uh, probably yeah, it's the very first planetary nebula ever discovered. Charles Messier didn't know it was a planetary nebula at the time, but, you know, it was the first one date-wise. Uh, you've got 1764. Actually, it's found on July 12th of 1764. Wow. The only reason I know the date is because that's my birthday. So. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not the 1700 part, though, right? Yeah, not the 1700, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, the actual date, he found it on July 12th, 1764. <laughs> That's amazing. Just the fact that you knew that, you didn't even have to say why you knew that. I mean, I think half the well, people you, are picking their jaw up off the floor right now. <laughs> you know I'm a planetary nebula nut. So I know you that, are. That is your thing. You totally got that it. Would, <laughs> okay, so how, it, do we, it, how do we find it's this lar thing? <laughs> you know, it's, it's relatively bright at magnitude 6.4 or so, mm -hmm. and it's relatively large at eight 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 arc minutes so mm -hmm. that's it's a big object uh, you know uh, let's see uh, you've got 30 arc minutes for a full moon so it's you know 816 yeah it's, it's roughly a quarter of a full moon so that's good sized I don't know, they might be fudging a little bit there, but uh, <laughs> it's definitely visible in binoculars. Uh, it's it's a really nice planetary nebula. It's roughly about, I've got number of 1,150 light years away. Again, never hold someone to planetary nebula distances because they they <laughs> run all over the place. They do, they do. Okay, here, so I'm going to make all the lines disappear. You guys see if you can put your finger on that one. Here, disappear, and then we've got one more thing. We're probably going to be together for probably another 15-ish minutes. we got one more constellation oh, to do. Um, so here we go. Quick, Here's the summer another triangle. Quick, yeah, go ahead, Kent. Oh, 
I was thinking another quick way to find the dumbbell. Yes. Remember how we were talking about that, where you go halfway, you know, distance-wise, if you go halfway between alberio and gamma, mm -hmm. and you rotate that down to right angle along the, uh, you know, for the axis of the cross, mm -hmm. uh, that'll bring you to the dumbbell. And so that's one way of finding it is to actually use the, uh, you know, as a distance and a right angle from our burial, kind of down to the uh, east there. Yes. So he's saying if you go along the body here, just from Deneb along the body of Cygnus the Swan, and then you make a 90 degree turn and go about half the distance from these two bright stars in the body, and then you'll hit it right in this area. See? But it's it, it should show up in binoculars. So if yeah. you sit back and just cruise you'll find it yep and that's the fun part too just kind of exploring and seeing and sure enough here it is awesome and then we've got the the coat hanger oh we forgot about the coat hanger okay yeah, let's we've got to talk about the coat this. hanger because it's really an asterism tell me it's another another asterism uh it's also referred to as brockel's cluster mm -hmm. which you know I, I don't know how they came i guess he found it and so uh he i think he was a scientist in the 1700s or something like that and uh it the people thought they might have been an open cluster but the stars are going in all different directions so you know it is not an open cluster it's just kind of a neat alignment of stars it looks like a coat hanger it does look like a coat hanger so do you see it it's kind of upside down i don't know if i i, I can't rotate this that quickly but um here are the stars that are all in a line and then here's the hook so there's our coat hanger it, right there. It's an easy binocular object, yeah. and it's easy, right easy. in the border of Valpecula there. Mm -hmm. And just for comparison, here's, um, here's the little fox, and here is the dumbbell we just talked about. And so it's between these two constellations. And so you go over here, and you'll see the coat hanger. And do you want to talk about Aquila the eagle next? Yes, let's talk about Aquila. I didn't okay, know much about the... this one until you told me about it. <laughs> yeah, Aquila's interesting. Uh, yeah, it you really You know, is. one of the legends that uh, uh, Zeus had his uh, gopher or fetch eagle it would go and get pick up humans and bring them up to serve for him, or it would mm -hmm. carry his uh, his lightning bolts for him. He really liked his eagle, and uh, he called it the Prince of Birds. And so, of course, Zeus would put it up in the heavens because it was his you know, his favorite fetch eagle or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, you know, there's, there's a, actually a bunch of different legends, but I kind of like the fetch eagle one. So <laughs> that's the one I'm sticking with for now. Yep. And so the bright star in this one is which star? That is uh, Altair, which mm -hmm. is an unusual star. Uh, Altair is only, let's see, it's, it's about, oh, 17 light years away in distance. Um, it's about one, actually, I got 1.8 times the mass of the sun. The interesting thing about Altair is it is spinning extremely fast. In fact, if you doubled the speed of it, it would tear itself apart. As it is, it's turning on its axis every nine hours. And it's about twice the, the equatorial diameter of our sun. Uh, our sun takes 25 days, roughly, to spin once on its axis. So, you know, Altair is really booking along. And it's spinning so fast that the equators have spanned it out and the poles have shrunk down. So it's twice the diameter of our sun in the, in the equator, but... Yeah, kind of like an egg. I mean, the thing is really, uh, really kind of stretched out at the equator because it's spinning so fast. Wow. And so that's, it, you know, that's kind of like the claim to fame. It's 11 <laughs> times brighter than our sun, and uh, it's just the shape of it. If you were in a spaceship looking at it, <laughs> you'd see this doesn't look right. <laughs> it's not a nice sphere. <laughs> and so it's you know it's really hauling 
That's why amazing. it's spinning so fast, I have no idea. <laughs> now, most of the things we've talked about, we can see naked eye or with binoculars, with the exception of the ring. Now, oh, also, yeah. Alberio is called the Eagle Star by the Babylonians and the Sumerians. Oh, okay. And so that's another little tidbit that I managed to dig out of the books. <laughs> now, so there's something in the handout that I printed, but it's more of a telescope object. This was kind of like a little bonus for those of you who may have never seen the Snowball Nebula. You'll find that information down here, it's, and you can actually find it in one of Altair's wings. Um, but that's not going to be an ocular object. Do you want to talk about um, V Aquila? Yeah, let's talk about um, the fish hook at the bottom of Aquila first. Yes. Because that ties in with the Aquila, but you can see there's like a little hook at the bottom of uh, uh, Aquila the eagle there. It's actually part of the hook is going into a, a small constellation called Scutum there. But uh, there is an interesting star. It's like the second brightest one. You've got the bright one at the end of the tail. And then you go down a little bit further, and there's a second brightest. I think it's called 12 Aquila. And there's three little stars that are peeling off above it. And then they point towards a red star. You can actually see the color. I've seen in my 8x50 uh, finder scope. It's called V Aquila, and it has a real colorful tint, especially it's at, if it's at a minimum. It's a variable star, so it gets a little brighter little bit dimmer. When it's in the dimmer phase, it's actually what they call carbon star. Um, the, the actual physics of the star is making a lot of carbon and it gets drugged up into the atmosphere. And the thing about carbon is it scatters blue light really well. And so you're losing all the blue light, you're just getting the red light come through. Awesome. And so again, Does that kind of make sense the... there? Yeah, right at the tail here, we're looking at the tail itself, and then we're going down one, and then there's this little curve of stars. Yeah, there's three little stars that kind of curve off, and then they kind of point and towards if you extended it. this is the one we're looking at here. So that's would one you be, can look uh, the Aquila, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's just, a, you know, it's real easy to find because that fish hook is easy to find. Yeah. And awesome. then you just kind of go off that little arc. And there's V Aquila. So it's mm -hmm. always nice when they're easy to find like that. Yeah, it is nice. Now tell us, there's um, M11? Yeah, yeah. M11 is in kind of just below the fish hook. And it's actually in, uh, you know, uh, a scutum. But it's such a neat object. And because it's near the fish hook, I figured we'd throw it in. Mm -hmm. M11 is a very bright and condensed open cluster. And they called it the wild duck cluster. I'm not sure, but if you had a really, really bad telescope <laughs> and maybe bad eyes, you could call it like, you know, a V-shape with, uh, you know, ducks flying south or something or north. <laughs> but to the, you know, to me, uh, one of the club members called it the Borg cube. And it does look kind of like a cubical form. There's actually one kind of yellow star kind of towards the corner, you know. So we've started calling it the Borg Cube at the star parties. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly bright. It's magnitude 6.3, um, you know, in my 20-inch and with the low-power 32-millimeter eyepiece, we're running about 79 power. It, you know, it does look like a Borg Cube. It does. And, you know, but the, the Wild Duck Cluster... That has like the priority. It's like a really old nickname, so you don't get rid of really old nicknames. They no. stick around. <laughs> it's like the ones you get in school you can't get rid of. Okay, so real quick, in rel I'm going to show you relative to the, the, the summer triangle here. Deneb, Vega, and Altair. Remember where the harp is? It's up here. Lyra is the parallelogram, and we have the double-double. That's in here. The ring is over here. Uh, Deneb, that's duck butt for the star, um, star for Cygnus the swan. Alberio is its head, which is on its way through the two other bright stars here. That has the double, the red, and the, uh, the red. It's kind of an orange and blue color. The wings were here. There was something interesting right by the cross. There's also something interesting right off this wing. 
And then over here, we see Altair, and Altair, let me put, put it a little bit higher. Okay, and then here's the shape of it. You got it? I'm gonna turn it off. Okay, here's the shape. Okay, so we're gonna go this way for the body, and the wings kinda come out here. The snowball is in one of these, I forget which one, one of these wings, and we didn't actually show it tonight. And then this is the hook at the bottom with the carbon star down here. And then, the, so just look at the, the tail end of the eagle and you'll be able to see the wild duck cluster we were talking about and that reddish variable that was in there. How's that for star hopping? You know, How did I do? You know, that, that wild duck cluster M11 is an easy binocular object. Yeah. You, in fact, I think the first time I saw it, I was just scanning and I saw this fuzzy thing. What is that? And, uh, you know, pulled out my atlas and started to look, oh, yeah, that's M11. <laughs> so it's definitely an easy object in binoculars. Nice. All right. So that actually concludes the, st uh, the, the star tour part. But before, wait, before you go, um, we're actually going to take some questions and answer them right now. But before you go, <laughs> if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please drop a note to Kent. I actually copy and paste this entire thing and send it over to him. Let him know exactly what you like tonight, what you're excited about, something that you that really was made you go, oh, wow, that's cool. I'm going to go look at that. And just let him know how you enjoyed tonight's presentation. That would be fantastic. So go ahead and drop that in the comment box, the chat box right now. You can also um, send me an email, questions at centralcoastastronomy.com org and let us know your specific questions and also your feedback from tonight and if you aren't a member of our club it's easy to become a member you can just go to our website www.centralcoastastronomy.org that's super simple and you can click on becoming a member and it's super inexpensive and you get to do fun things like this as well as the member hangouts um, okay other question uh, we've got a number of questions Brian are you still oh, Kent don't go anywhere you're not done yet <laughs> yeah, I'm still here so okay good <laughs> Um, Brian, let me see if I can find you. Are you still here? Yes, you are. I'm here. You're hidden. You're hidden underneath all my windows. Hang on. <laughs> okay, hang on just a second. Gotcha. All right, Brian. So. Yes. All right. Do you have some questions for Kent? Do you want to? Yes, I do. So, so this is a question from Luis. How do we estimate the distance when observing other galaxies? Uh, you know, there's the old redshift uh, phenomena. And basically, they started with the nearest galaxies trying to work out the distance, like um, Andromeda is the nearest big galaxy to them. They found these variable stars called Cephids. And they, that, that was kind of like the first step to getting the distance to Andromeda, but for further away stars, you know, or not stars, but actually further away galaxies, they found out that the further away it was, the more it was redshifted, which is actually, when you look at the spectra, it actually shifts more to the red end, which means it's moving away from us. And so they've been using redshift as kind of a really easy way of roughly finding out how far away the you know the further galaxies are for the closer in ones especially since we got the hubble they're using cepheid variables uh, they uh, uh, basically as a pulsate the pulsation rate is tied to the absolute brightness and so that gives you a standard candle and so if it looks at a certain magnitude in this way off galaxy you can work it back and say, oh, yeah, that's 200 million light years away. And But if you didn't have the Hubble, you'd be out of luck because you can't see Cephids that far away easily. And so that's my quick and dirty explanation. <laughs> All right, excellent. <laughs> All right, thank you for that one. Shall I go on with uh, some yeah. more questions, Aurora? Do you have a couple more questions? Okay. Um, anything I do. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, this is another question that came in. When you're looking up at the night sky, how can you tell the difference, if you can, between a planet and a star? Ah, planets, if, if you're just looking with your eye, you have to be patient. If you've never seen the night sky, planets move with respect to the fixed stars. In fact, planet from Greek means wanderer, 
the they were the stars that moved across the sky where the constellations of fixed stars they always stayed in the same pattern for the most part so if you didn't have a telescope you're just relying on your naked eye if you went out and looked at the star night to night to night and it moved with respect to the other stars you most likely got a planet also it would be relatively bright in comparison to a lot of the stars now i know also that uh stars twinkle is there any difference with that with the planet uh you know it has to do with brightness uh planets you know the light coming from the planet still has to go through our atmosphere and they can twinkle really good when they're low <laughs> when they get up it just has to do with the brightness uh planets are usually pretty darn bright so uh, they don't twink they don't appear to twinkle as much but they do twinkle so i i've heard that you know that said about stars twinkle and planets stay steady but in reality planets are so bright they look steady and uh you know stars are usually relatively fainter so they it's easier to see something faint twinkling and then also where you look at it. if it's straight overhead it's not going to twinkle very much if it's low the horizon since you're looking through all that wiggly atmosphere it you know they can get almost anything to twinkle if it's down low does that kind of make yes. sense Brian Oh yeah it does yes and i have found that to be a fairly good gauge of the quality of the seeing if planets are twinkling too we know things are not doing too well with the atmosphere Oh I yeah we usually have to... to sit back and wait <laughs> Yes. Wait for a couple hours and let it get higher, and then it, you know it's a little bit better. Ah, uh, yes, I believe too. In a sense, uh, stars are a point source for us, and planets, because they're so much closer, have slight amount of angular size, and I think that helps have a an object come through the atmosphere, so there can be less twinkle when it's a that planet. That could be that could be a point. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with that. But uh, you're right about it being from an actual angular source. And so that could awesome. definitely make a difference. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, Kent. Hey. And Aurora, I'm going to give this one to you. Yes, I get the fun one. Yes, um, you do. this one submitted quite a bit. <laughs> so the question is, yes. what is a black hole? <laughs> so here we go. Really quick. And Kent, you, I know you're going to give me a, a really serious definition. So this is for the kids. So it's black because nothing can, once light goes in, it's not coming back out. And hole because once you fall in, you're not coming out the same way. And it, you can think of a black hole as, it, well, if I have this ball and I throw it up in the air, eventually it'll come back down, right? And it, no matter how far, now watch me like smack myself. <laughs> and so, um, so what goes up comes down. What goes up comes down. If I were to throw this thing over seven miles a second, now it's going at a speed that will escape the pull of gravity due to the Earth. If I were to stand on something more massive, like the sun, without burning up or getting squished, um, and I were to throw this, I would have to have to throw it a lot faster, like 400 times, or 400 miles per second before it'll actually escape the sun's gravitational pull. So a black hole is an object where that velocity that you have to throw this ball in order for it to escape that gravitational pull on it is faster than the speed of light. So a black hole is an object where the escape velocity is faster than C, the speed of light. So you can think of it that way. So that's my quick and easy definition of how to think of a black hole. Um, a lot of people think of them as giant b vacuum cleaners, cosmic vacuum cleaners with infinite sized bags that go around and suck things up, galaxies and stuff. And really, they're really passive. They just kind of sit there and wait for stuff to fall in. They're not actively seeking their prey like a tiger. Um, it, it's like a basketball hoop. You, it, it just sits there waiting for the ball to come in, right? The basketball hoop doesn't go like chasing you all over the court, right? So <laughs> you're, you're wait, it's waiting for stuff to fall in. When it's falling in, it's actively feeding. And then you've got x-rays you can look for and all kinds of stuff. Um, but in, so in general, they're not something to, you don't have to worry about it. There's none nearby that we know of. Um, there's actually on the NASA website, you can look at the 20 plus, I forget exactly the number that of confirmed black holes we have in our area of the galaxy, which is kind of cool. And they estimate there's a lot more. They're just hard to detect. Kent, do you want to add anything to that? 
I've got a nickel to throw in. <laughs> Absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. Black holes are really, really small also. Uh, if you're at a distance, you know, a reasonable distance, uh, you can't tell the difference from the gravitational influence from a star. It's when you get in close because it's like taking the, uh, you know, a mass the size of our sun and squishing it way down to something really small, you know, probably about a couple miles across. Mm -hmm. So you really don't get in trouble unless you get close. And then there's tidal force problems and other things like that that hit. But they are very small objects. You don't get big ones until you start talking about the black holes at centers of galaxies that yes. have, you know, millions of solar masses. Yes. Yeah, it's like um, imagining Manhattan and you shove it into something the size of a shoebox. So even though it's the same amount of mass, but now it's so small and densely packed in there. And that's what we're talking about with black holes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, Brian, you got any more questions for us? That does it for the questions right now, awesome. I would say. Awesome, awesome. I have a couple that have come in. Um, let me see. Kent, um, one of the questions is, um, what do you recommend for stargazing if you are a parent and you have a kid? Do we get them a telescope? Actually, I get them a pair of binoculars first. Okay, tell me about that. I'm holding a pair of 10, 10 X50s. Yeah, binoculars are, you know, they're cheap. They give you a view through both eyes, so you have a very wide field, so you can look around. Uh, they're real easy to uh, learn the constellations with, especially if you're in a light-polluted area. And you can use them for all sorts of other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like looking at birds or, you know, faraway objects. Or my girlfriend, you know, use them to look at the neighbors or whatever, <laughs> you know. And so binoculars are really good. Uh, you know, because if you don't, you know, the kid's not interested in, uh, in the astronomy, you can always use it for all sorts of other stuff. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, another question that came in, can we see everything you just showed us tonight with binoculars? Uh, no, <laughs> that's, uh, most that's, of it. Uh, you can see most, uh, most, most of the stuff with binoculars that we brought up tonight. Yes. Um, you know, uh, you'd have to, for the ring nebula, you'd probably have to pop a filter in mm -hmm. to uh, actually pull that in. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, most of the stuff we've talked about tonight, you have to have a dark sky, and uh, it's well positioned now. These, these objects are straight overhead, so you're not looking through that much atmosphere. So you could, you know, you could basically see most everything with binoculars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and honestly, telescopes are pretty useless if you don't know where to point them. And so learning the night sky just by doing things we're doing tonight, we only stayed in a very small area, but we got to know it really well. And so you don't have to take in the whole enchilada at once. Just get to know one part of the sky, get to know the patterns, just practice seeing things over and over. That's why we repeated it tonight. And then move on to the next set of constellations, two or three constellations, and work on those. And then after a while, work on those. And pretty soon, as you work slowly at this, it's like working out at the gym. You don't just go once and that's it. <laughs> you, you have to slowly work at it as you go along. And pretty soon, you're going to be able to look out, and no matter what time of year it is, and go out there and be able to say, oh, you know what, I, I remember ABC is over here. And so it's, it's, it's a process of learning and discovery. Um, other questions? I do have one more, unless, Brian, you've got one. Yes. Uh, let's, let me pass this one on that just came in. And I'd actually like to answer a little bit of it okay. as the question was asked, what is the best magnification for binoculars to use for astronomy? And I was going to propose that a 10 times magnification would be a good to start with. Mm -hmm. And as astronomers, the bigger, the better, right? The more <laughs> magnification we could have, the more light we could pull in, the happier we are. But there's always a trade-off. For instance, we have those binoculars behind you oh. that require a tripod to hold them up. So the bigger we get, the heavier they get. And that's really true for any astronomical equipment. So 20, I would say, right, 20 by 70s or so. What are those? Oh, those are 25 you? by 100. 
Yeah, so that's 25 magnification with a 100 millimeter opening or aperture, right? Yeah, right in here. So, and those will give you amazing views, uh, but you're going to need a tripod and then it takes a little more practice to uh, get them pointed in the line. So we say, like Kent, I agree with Kent and Aurora, start with a small pair and then grow from there. Yeah, yes. you're exactly right, Brian. Uh, my, my grandfather's naval 7x50s, mm -hmm. I had to build up the strength of my arms <laughs> to uh, hold yeah. them. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so I have another question that yeah, came please, in, if you'd ahead. like. Sure. <clears throat> so Mohammed had just asked, what kind of telescope do you re recommend, reflector or refractor? And... So well, can't basically, larger is better, so refractors are, are more expensive than reflectors. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and so to... Oh, go ahead, Ken. Oh, yeah, so so basically, you know, if you're... You know, as a really nice telescope, those, uh, you know, what are they, about 8-inch eight, uh, eight uh, Dobsonian-mounted... Uh, reflector. Um, I don't know who's selling them. Orion used to sell them. They were relatively cheap. Where I don't even know what the price of an eight-inch refractor would be. It no, would yeah, be way uh, up there. I see. Uh, for the most part, with the refractor, which, by the way, f uh, for those listening, would be a series of lenses all in a row, uh, refracting or bending the light to magnify it. We usually see about five inches to be about the max for practical. Although you look at those historical refractors, right, Kent, and they were quite large. Oh yeah, the one up at uh, uh, Lick Observatory is, uh, that's, I think it was a 36 inch. Uh, nice. They actually had to modify the shape for the sag by its own weight. <laughs> uh, it was an excellent, it was a work of art, but I believe it was the largest refractor in the world when they first put it up on Mount Hamilton in 1888 or somewhere around there. Wow. wow. Very cool. Yeah. And, and so for reflector, you get much more bang for your buck. And what I always like to recommend is as soon as we can be all gathering in the same place, find your local astronomical club. And hopefully it's us if you're in the central California area go out and try some telescopes that the club members have. And that'll, that gives you the best feel for what's available in different sizes. Yeah, that's the, that's really good advice, Brian. That's awesome. awesome. Okay. Well, I think we probably need to wrap it up here. What do you think? Yes, we, yeah. we are here an hour and a half. Yes. We have actually, we've maxed out our time. So, all right, Kent, well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to share your expertise and your passion with astronomy. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure you let Kent know by leaving him a comment in the box below, or you can send it into questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. Our next presentations you can actually find on our website, www.centralcoastastronomy.org. We do, we're planning a stargazing session for September as well. But for tonight, I mean, this presentation will last you for the next couple of weeks, if not month. So that summer triangle is going to be up for a long time. <laughs> so make sure you download this if you haven't already. This is the handout that went with tonight's presentation. And I encourage you to go out tonight and not just practice yourself, but share it with others so we can keep this going and have that ripple effect and have people that may not even have been interested in astronomy suddenly go, oh, wow, really cool. What is that Cheerio looking thing in my in my scope vision so just be excited to do astronomy and science and keep the the passion for astronomy alive so if you do have questions that didn't get answered please let me know aurora at uh, centralcoastastronomy.org and you can always send me an email and if you've got a quick question you better type it in now and brian can answer it because this chat box is about to go away so you want to make sure you get your questions entered in so brian thank you so much for helping out tonight thank you glad awesome. to be here thank you and thank you kent for being here those of you who are wondering why can i not see kent um, he is actually uh, not he's just on a regular old phone talking to us so he didn't have any star charts out 
he was just having a conversation with somebody on the phone. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Kent. You're amazing. You've been my mentor for 15 years now. So thank you. Thank you. And, well, thank um, you very much, Aurora. You have a good one. Thanks. Guys, you take too. care. You too. See you thank later. You. See you later, Kent. Bye. Okay. All right, everyone. Bye. Take care. Brian, I will see you next time. Okay, see you next time. Thanks, All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night.